Hello and welcome everybody to the SLA CIC learning series. Thank you so much for taking the time to join this outstanding community and learn something new. My name is Liz Frickleton and I'm with Aurora WDC. We've been a longtime sponsor and supporter of the SLA CIC. I've got just a few announcements for you before we get started. So let me go ahead and share my screen. All right. So today we have the privilege of welcoming Victoria and Monique with us today. We're talking about breaking down silos and the intersections between CX and CI. Um, we want to keep this session um, engaging. So please use the chat and the Q&A panel um, and we will keep um, your questions um, for the speakers until the end or maybe throughout. So um, just keep those coming. Um, we will record the session as well. So you'll receive an email in a couple days with that. Okay, so I always plug the CIC mentorship program and this is your opportunity to serve or maybe you're a mentee looking for somebody to gain wisdom from. There's plenty of willing mentors. So um, this is your chance to step up and um, request a mentor in the field. So we have quite a wide constituent pool um, that includes students and existing CI members, CI fellows, SKIP members. This is um, kind of a group or a combined effort where we all have um, just the, we want to provide a way to educate and foster innovative thinking. If you're interested, please um, message Phil for more information. All right, and there's some CIC leadership opportunities available as well. So you'll see those on the screen. Um, we have the chair elect, content chair, student liaison, membership chair, and even the um, conference chair available. And so if you're interested in that, please contact Kate Vilches and she'd be happy to give you more information. So you're not signing up for anything. Um, it's just a way to ask questions. All right. Next is the registration. Um, it is open for the CI Fellows 2023 event. And this year's theme is Competitive Intelligence Transforming for New Realities. It's September 27th and 28th, and it's held virtually on the Zoom events platform. Aurora is proud to be a sponsor again. And um, one of the quotes from the mission statement I thought was relevant, um, in service to the CI profession and CI professional. And I just really admire the CI fellows and what they're bringing forth for us this year. I mean, look at all of the different speakers on the, on the screen there. Um, some of them even uh, in the audience today and Monique as well is one of those. Um, so please check out the link that's in the chat and see if you're able to, to save that date and get involved. And then finally, to close our CIC webinar series this year, we're um, very excited to welcome Dr. Ken Saka back to the stage. And he is going to be talking through the role of CI in business strategy. He's um, a currently um, adjunct professor and been a longtime CI professional and consultant as well as CI fellow. So we're very, very excited to have him back. And there will be a link in the chat to get registered. You do have to sign up again, so make sure you do that. Um, and some of you already in the audience, I think, are already on our list. So thank you very much for, for getting early bird registration there. Um, okay, I got a couple more things, and then we'll get to Monique and Victoria. The CI, the Practical Guide to CI is a book that was produced by the SLA um, organization um, with our three collaborators in chief, Zena, Elise, and Phil. And they, along with Victoria and Monique here on the screen, have gifted us with such practical wisdom about how to do our jobs in CI. And um, I've just included them at the top of this list, but there's so many other contributors that you'll see on the screen. So if this is something that you're interested in, um, there'll be some links in the chat to pick up the book. Um, okay. With that, I've alluded to this, but I'm just very, very grateful to have Victoria and Monique with us today. And um, I'll start with Victoria. She's Director of Client Experience at Baker Tilly, professional services firm. She's also an author of the uh, aforementioned book, and she focused her chapter on keeping the human in intelligence. 
And I think she's going to bring some of those insights today too, and is also a CI fellow and just um, a great friend. Uh, and then Monique is head of global competitive intelligence at Qualtrics and um, was able to author a book chapter as well in the SLA guide. And it was about incorporating customer insights, which will for sure be relevant today. So thank you again, Monique. And she's also contributing her perspectives for the CI Fellows coming up on the 28th with a panel alongside Tracy and Scott and Ben. And it's focused on the future of human intel in an AI world. So very, very relevant panel there. So I think with that, I'm going to hand it over to you both. Um, just thank you again for sharing your perspectives. I can't wait to jump in. Over to you. Thanks, Liz. Thank you. Um, I won't speak for Monique, but I, I think we're both very happy to be here. Uh, very excited to talk with you all today. And thank you so much for all of the questions that you all asked before we started. We had a lot of fun at the end of last week going through and figuring out how can we answer as many of these as possible in the time that we have allotted because you guys were so curious and that's what we love to see. So thank you for your participation before we even began. So Monique, what do you think? Should we talk about CI versus CX? That was probably the hottest topic that we were I asking I think about. so. I think that there were a, a lot of questions really just trying to understand, first, what is CX? I think a lot of times we use these acronyms and we assume that people uh, know exactly what we're talking about. So, you know, we, we do want to maybe break down what is CI versus CX? What do those acronyms mean and 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 how do they come together? Yeah, actually, Liz, I think we can start with with the screen just went past. You know, I think everyone who's ever heard me give any talk at any venue has heard me say that no type of intelligence is siloed. So we might talk a lot about competitive intelligence. We might talk a lot about client experience and client intelligence or customer intelligence. But intelligence is always, um, there are a lot of players involved. It covers a lot of ground and none of them operate in silos. And so if that's a new concept to you, get ready because there are a lot of intersections between all of the types of intelligence. And even though we're going to focus on client and customer experience and CI and the intersections therein, you're going to hear as we talk that we have to take in a lot from the industries and markets and, and vendors and everything else that goes into it. So these two things really can't operate independently of themselves, nor can any part of intelligence. Yeah, absolutely. And, I, and I've been a part of organizations where there have been teams focused on these specific, specific departments. So there may be like a very specific product intel group or a competitive intelligence group or even a market intel group that looks at, you know, new market entry does overall, um, you know, size of marketing analysis and things along that line. But to Victoria's point, you know, it, it's really best when these siloed uh, views of intelligence really come together and provide a comprehensive view in the market. And we cannot leave out customers from that equation, regardless of any of the other parts of this that we're looking at. So that's why we're really excited about this topic. So let's talk a little bit about what is CI, what is CX? I think everybody on this call probably knows what CI is to some extent. You know, we're really looking at competitors, what they're doing, what they're building, buying, how are they reaching out to their customers? How are they reaching out to the markets? How are they putting themselves out there? And there's a lot more that goes into that, right? When we talk about customer experience or client experience, we're really talking about how are customers interacting with your company? How are they interpreting your brand when they see your advertising? How do they um, actually go through the journey of exploring your products and buying them? How have you built that journey? How are you reacting to them within that journey? And how do you manage, well, how do you measure and then manage client perceptions of what you're doing across your brand, across your product build, across everything else? It's a lot, right? It's a big bucket of stuff that goes into customer experience. Monique, did I miss anything that's worth pointing out there? Yeah, no, absolutely. I totally agree. It's all about the various touch points that a customer has with your brand, everywhere from just general awareness. So they may not even be a, a customer yet. And it's just about 
what, you know, from an awareness perspective, what is their perception even prior to becoming a customer, all the way through that customer journey and the various places in which they'll interact um, with your company and how those perceptions are being shaped along that journey. And that's really where customer experience um, works is to optimize that perception, optimize that experience um, that the customers have with your with your company along their customer journey so that they either become a customer, a very happy customer at some point and really reduce that risk of churn at the end of the day. Yeah, Monique, I think you hit it right on the head. So I think the big question on a lot of people's minds here is how do these two things intersect? And I have a feeling that a lot of folks are already kind of putting this together. Uh, Liz, you can go ahead and perfect, thank you. Um, so really where they intersect, and this isn't the only place that they intersect, but we're really looking at where our competitors are building their customer journey and how their customers and their prospects are interacting with that, how are our potential prospects and customers are potentially interacting with our competitors and figuring out why they're building what they're building for their customers, not just what they're doing, but how they're trying to attack customers' pain points and how they're interacting with them overall. So hopefully that's a pretty easy intersection to see at this point. And I think it's important to, again, call here how these two things can't operate in a silo and they're also impacted by everything else going on in the market, everything else going on in the industry, everything going, going on across um, other factors that can really impact what these businesses are doing. Yeah, absolutely. I think um, it's really important, especially as we're entering into this time of increased competition, um, companies really taking a look at all of the different types of you know, in the B2B space, all the different types of vendor relationships that they have um, in the B2C space, um, looking just at share of wallet, where companies are spending their money. Mm -hmm. um, it's real. It's so much more highly competitive now, uh, maybe than it's ever been. And so understanding where your competitors are performing really well from a customer experience perspective, how are they retaining their customers? How are they delighting their customers? Um, you know, that may uh, may shine a light on opportunities um, for your own company to look at ways to augment customer experience. And then on the other side, where are your competitors maybe not meeting the mark? And does that create an even bigger opportunity for a new product innovation, um, a new customer journey that you can take the customers on, um, but just some new other ways to acquire customers in this highly competitive space? Yep. Yeah. Absolutely, Monique. Um, so really briefly, it's probably worth talking about CX versus UX. I know that there was a lot of kind of confusion about this. And when we talk about CX, we're really talking about anything within the entire potential realm of which we interact with our clients. And UX is something very, very specific. We're talking about a user experience within a product, typically. And so UX is, let's say you, you purchase something and you're trying to get into the product and figure out how the interface works, how the features work. That's really where UX is. It is a part of the overall client journey. So it is a piece of CX, but there is a little bit of a distinction there. Yeah, I would totally agree with that, Liz. So there were a lot of questions about career paths and how these two things have intersected for us. So Monique, you want to kick us off with that? Sure. So, um, you know, I think Liz and I, I'm mean, sorry, Victoria and I have some really um, interesting backgrounds in having that intersection between CX and CI and really being able to lead organizations on both sides um, of the table. Uh, for me, my career path, as for many CI folks out there, I'm sure um, you're familiar with, um, I just kind of landed in CI, uh, working at Capital One um, in our new product innovation group back in the late 90s, um, where there was, I don't even know if competitive intelligence was a, a term that was coined back then. Maybe it was. Uh, I, I wasn't aware of it. Um, so I started there and then quickly moved onto the vendor side of competitive intel, um, serving as a research arm for large Fortune 500 companies looking to understand more about their competitors, help them to develop competitive strategy, uh, and things along that line. And then I moved over to the client side uh, and led the global uh, department um, for CI for ADP, 
uh, and then also did some CI um, at Equifax thereafter. Um, but that's actually where I was introduced to the world of CX. I hadn't really heard of customer experience as a discipline prior to going to the CX or uh, CX organization within Equifax. Um, and I actually led our workforce solutions strategies, uh, customer experience strategy unit, um, along with our customer insights unit. Um, and that is really where I started to interact the most with our customers, really understanding uh, pain points um, in their journey, really understanding um, you know, areas of opportunity for us as an organization to work more closely together, melding in operations with sales, with marketing, to create more cohesive um, experiences for our customers. And then through that process, realizing that there was a good, rich amount of competitive insights that were coming in from our customers as well. And having been a competitive Intel professional for all that time, really started realizing that the CX team was a rich source of competitive insights as well and, and working to develop those relationships. Um, I, I left Equifax and joined Qualtrics back <laughs> underneath the CI hat um, that I've held for many years, but certainly more well-rounded from that time uh, spent running that customer experience strategy unit within Equifax. Um, and so working here going forward on helping to strengthen the relationship between CX and CI so that we get that more comprehensive view of what's happening in the marketplace, incorporating those customer insights along with everything else that's happening in the marketplace from a competitive perspective. Monique, I'm so impressed with your background. <laughs> when we talk about it, I'm just like, oh my gosh, there, I have so many things that I could just pick your brain about for hours and hours and hours. Um, I Thank came, you for it. <laughs> I came into this um, in a very meandering and wandering way. Um, back at the start of my career, I was in nonprofit research, qualitative research. So I was interviewing, specifically, I was interviewing high schoolers with ADD, trying to figure out how we could make standardized testing better for them. Um, that was after uh, my first master's, which was in um, communication, so really research methods. And so after the economy took a nosedive in the late uh, 2000s, I decided to go back and get my MBA, which shocked everyone. I don't think anyone ever thought of me getting a business degree, including myself. So, you know, proof, proof for everybody in the audience that you never know what you're capable of. And you never know what you're going to be doing in 10 years. It could be the total opposite of what you thought you'd be doing. Um, and it was in my MBA program that I actually found competitive intelligence. It was a concentration, a certification at the time within my program, and I just fell in love with it. It was such a great use of my qualitative research skills, and I loved it so much. I actually finished that certification before I finished my core requirements for my MBA. Um, and so when I finished that MBA, I launched headfirst into the intelligence world, specifically in tech. I was working with EMC for about a year in their competitive intelligence division, which of course, you know, EMC now Dell is a juggernaut company. So it's a very specific experience working in a very large CI department. And I got a lot of experience about what it's like to be in a pretty siloed um, place within the company. And then how hard it can be to pull strings from other pieces of a large company like that to make sure that we're putting the right information in the right hands at the right time um, and not just necessarily going and providing help to deals because there's much more, uh, there are many more use cases for intelligence than just that. I quickly jumped from there to a small tech firm called Carbonite where I was leading market and competitive intelligence. And that's where I got my first taste of how much the client experience impacts what we're doing. Um, and Monique, you and I were talking a little bit about this at the end of the week that, you know, you really have to have a true market need to have a big competitive intelligence function or market intelligence function or a specific CX function. A lot of times these things are all rolled into one because you're, what you're looking at for your product set is small or what you're looking at for your market is small. And so the advantage of being in a really um, small intelligence group like that is that you do get exposed to everything and you do have to have your hands in everything. And so I was able to really learn the ins and outs of figuring out CI for a small tech company and figuring out how the market really quickly impacts all of that intelligence. But 
specifically how when you're working with a smaller company, what you're building and the pain points that you're trying to solve for your for your clients and customers and what exactly you're building to help them, that matters first and foremost. So when I uh, left Carbonite and went into the legal field, I was still running intelligence work. I was running competitive intelligence and then market and competitive intelligence for business development. And I really missed being able to talk with clients and really figure out how what they needed was going to impact what we did. Um, so I, I was able to jump from there into actual product management for about a year, which was great working directly with the CX department, working directly with intelligence professionals and other product marketing folks and everyone across the, the company to figure out what to build. And now I get to lead CX. Finally, I, I am on the other side where I get to work with, uh, we have a separate intelligence team who does both quantitative intelligence, um, TAM work and all that fun stuff and market intelligence. I get to work with all of our client facing folks, all of our technology builders and help figure out what problems should we solve and why and how can we do that in a way that makes us competitive within our field. So there, there's a lot of different ways to walk this path between CI and CX, but they're always interacting with one another. Absolutely. Absolutely. I think that that's a good um, segue to really talk about how, how within our organizations, really tactically and specifically how we work together. Um, so for, for all transparency purposes, I work for a company um, called Qualtrics, and we are the leader in the customer experience <laughs> engagement um, industry. And so our product, our solution that we sell is a customer experience um, tool, along with other types of experience management tools um, across, across the spectrum here. Um, so it's very interesting First, doing CX, um, using Qualtrics as a solution uh, at my previous employer, uh, and then moving to Qualtrics, doing CI for a CX company. So there is a lot of uh, intersection there when I just think about, you know, think about my role in general. But within the company, we do have a customer experience COE, um, you know, that I have partnered with. We've gone through, um, you know, some transformations here internally and have a, a newly designed COE and so we're we're starting now to really get some of our um, you know rules of engagement and um, processes down for how we're going to work together. But one of the first ways that we found um, that we can really start to partner is at the very top of the customer experience, if you will, um, journey, which is around win loss. Um, and so I like to not necessarily call it win loss, um, especially when it's not only looking through a competitive lens. I like to call it buyer experience or buyer insights. And so we consider that, you know, that one of the first touch points outside of the awareness building piece of it. Um, but one of the first touch points that customers have with our internal folks, you know, at the company as they're evaluating our solutions and deciding whether they want to, you know, want to work with us. And so that is a really key area for competitive Intel, you know, the program that I'm leading, as well as our CXCOE to come together to say, okay, what are the human insights, right, that are coming out of this program? Rather than just what competitors were we up against? Did we win or lose? What was the price that they offered and all of that? You know, what is the real human feedback that we got? And these may be our future customers, you know, either it was a win. So this is going to be our customer going forward, or it was a loss. And, and what was the real human emotion behind that loss? Because a lot of times, yes, it comes down to something very tactical, but sometimes it comes down to, Hey, you guys didn't return my calls in time. And I really, we had a tight window and I really wanted someone that was really responsive or the, or the solution that was presented. It didn't really feel t tailored to my needs. It didn't feel tailored and, and didn't meet my expectations. And so those are really human emotions. And so that is an opportunity for our customer experience COE to learn about that customer at the very start of the relationship and start building in, okay, we understand these are the expectations of the customer. These are the ways that we need to deliver for this customer. Um, and then we can work together on that journey to see are we meeting those expectations that we set, you know, during those sales conversations? 
um, all the way through to, I also work with the team during those churn events, right? So what happened? <laughs> and when did we have insight into something that was going a little bit off the rails, whether, whether it was through our consistent feedback process that we have, um, or whether it was through a call that came in through the contact center or something that happened on the website, do we have the right measurement pieces in place to really understand whether this relationship is still on the rails or not? And so where I rejoin that conversation a lot of times is in the churn event is to understand, okay, what happened? Why, why are they leaving? We do do um, exit interviews and exit surveys. Why are they leaving? Um, are they going to a competitor? What's their perception of the competitor? What do they think the competitor can do that we couldn't do? How do we then take that feedback that's typically kind of competitive intel feedback, but feed that back into our customer success program to say, hey, this is their perception. This is how we could have retained them. Here are some um, messaging that we can use if we think that they're going to be going to or considering a competitor so that we can retain this, this customer. So these are some of the ways, you know, so I would say I work really closely with our CX team at the very front end through our buyer experience interviews and surveys, and then also incorporating that information kind of at the back end, um, whether there's a churn event, um, if, if that occurs as well through, through surveys as well as uh, through interviews. Tony, win loss is such a big tool that really causes CI and CX to intersect quite a bit. Um, at Paper Tilly, where I currently am, we're actually just standing up win loss analysis and we're doing it on the CX side. We are actually collaborating with our sales enablement team. And we're not only doing um, win loss surveys specifically at the end of a deal, but we're actually doing them in the middle as well uh, because that's a source of intelligence, again, to your point, Monique, about how they're feeling about where we are in the deal, but also how their state, the other stakeholders at the customer are feeling. It gives them an opportunity to give us feedback that we may not otherwise get, and that is before the emotions of a deal being closed on mm -hmm. one side or the other. And I think that that's a key point that a lot of folks miss out on by the time an opportunity closes, uh, you know, you're really, someone's either sitting in a bad feeling about you because you weren't able to be responsive or provide what you needed, or they're feeling really elated. And so the feedback is going to be a little bit biased. But if you go in in the middle of an opportunity, then you're really going to get something that's actionable. And whether that's, you know, I'm just seeing a lot of other solutions that, that, you know, really make a difference in our decision here, or my stakeholder isn't really sold on the value or the price or what have you, um, you know, win-loss um, and specifically intradeal win-loss is really important, um, both for information and for, a, again, a measurement of what our clients' uh, measurement of success is for working with us. Um, I love that, Victoria. I'm, I'm, <laughs> I would love to know, how do you how do you implement that? So do you send like a survey, like after a demo presentation? I mean, I'm in tech, so there's a lot of like demos and things along that line. And I understand there are other industries here, but at what point in the sales process do you introduce this feedback um, uh, mechanisms? I think I think that you're so right. By the time we do it at the end, some it's you can't recover from it, right? So you're just like, you're just really learning the drivers behind the decision, but you're not at an opera, you're not at a space to influence the decision. So I would love to know kind of when do you do that and how do you do that? So that's a great question. And I think for, I, I can speak to how we're doing it, but I think for every company, it's going to be a little bit different because you all will know your sales cycle, uh, you know, in depth and you'll know when there tends to be a pause. And I think that that is kind of the best place to say, hey, we're going to send you a survey because we'd love to get your feedback about how this is going. And maybe you don't feel right telling us directly, or maybe you want a second to go collaborate with your other stakeholders, but you're going to get a survey tomorrow. And I'd really love some feedback so that we can see you know, how else we can be making this a great experience for you. 
um, you know, for us, we use um, Salesforce's CRM. So we have things automated along the opportunity. We have it go out at a specific point on that opportunity. Uh, but again, for every company, it's going to be a little bit different. And I think, again, the key is to look at when you have that bit of a pause. Everybody's taking a breath and saying, okay, where are we in this? And that's really the prime time to do it. It's a great question, though. That is um, awesome. And this is new to me too. Um, this is the first time I've ever been able to do it in the middle of an opportunity. And I do think that there's a lot of value in that. Um, and we actually will be building interviews on top of it because as, as most people who know me know, um, I feel like surveys are very one dimensional. And I think you really get into the meat of what you need to know when you're talking with people because people will say one thing and their faces will tell you another, yeah. right? Yeah. Or they'll they'll say one thing and their actions will tell you another. And then how the hearsay that you hear from folks who know them down the line may tell you something else entirely and you get a much better sense of this if you're actually talking with them. And particularly if you're talking with them and you're kind of a neutral party, right? Mm -hmm. So as CX, and I think that this is a really important thing to point out, I always say we are the neutral arbiter of the client voice. We are here to guess to help our, our company, of course, to help our firm. We want to help our firm and our bottom line. But at the end of the day, we do that by focusing on our clients. Yeah. And sometimes that's saying what we're not doing right. And how can we fix yeah. that? Yeah. And you can do that a lot closer by having the opportunity to talk with clients. Um, another way that we're doing that outside of the win-loss function is through feedback sessions. And I think that this is something that a lot of folks specifically in product management are familiar with. Um, you can use these uh, in really any sort of scenario you need to. We specifically use them when looking at potentially building new products and services. Um, so this is, when I say client feedback session, I mean, it's about going to the client virtually, and in our case, most of the time, and trying to figure out if we, this idea that we have for this service, for this product, for this new offering, for this new segment, doesn't make sense. We call this pressure testing the value proposition. Mm -hmm. Having a conversation with them to understand, is the need that we think uh, is apparent, is it actually there? Are we misinterpreting this somehow? And the way that we think we're solving for this, does it make sense? And does it actually solve for the problem? And the thing is that what you uncover through conversations with clients and customers is that what you think the problem is, is often just slightly off center from what their actual problem is. And the way that you want to solve it, at least with the first pass, probably the second pass and the third pass at building a solution is probably also just off center. And so by going back and having conversations with them, you really are able to push that closer to center so that not only are you providing them a solution, but you have directly involved them in that solution. And that going back to Monique's comment about the emotional component, at the end of the day, that's what we're trying to do in customer experience is figure out what that emotional component is and how to tap into it. So if you're including client feedback in everything that you're doing in this case and figuring out what products to build or iterate on, then by directly using that emotional energy and, and direction in what you're building, you're going to form a connection with them that is really hard to break. I think, um, I think Amazon is a great example of this. They did that from the early days, right? Instant retail therapy gratification, for us, instant data gratification for companies, right? They just hit that right on the head and, and they didn't care about the competition at first. They just figured out what solutions to build for each of those segments and how those intersected and how to deliver them. And they iterated on that and it's made them so successful over the competition for a long time. It's just in the last few years that that competition has started to really be challenged because they found the customer. Absolutely. I think that's such a great point, especially when it comes to product development. You know, we're we're living in the age of AI, right? And so everyone, from what I'm seeing from a competitive perspective, is a ton of companies in the space just rushing out to say that they have something that is AI related um, because it is a buzzword and they know that, that customers are interested, curious, um, et cetera. 
Uh, but what we're also seeing is just kind of a rush to look at what's happening competitively and make sure that we can also check the box without really understanding, not we, call checks, I'm just saying we, the market, um, you know, doing those types of things in terms of just being able to check the box is kind of what I'm seeing across the marketplace instead of there really being real customer feedback guiding the product development and using language that actually resonates with the customers. Mm -hmm. um, you can kind of tell from some of the press releases from competitors and things along the line that it's just filled with a lot of um, you know, buzzwords, tech language, and it doesn't really even speak the language that our customers are speaking. And I know this because I'm reading the sentiments from our, our CX surveys, from our win-loss surveys, from our churn surveys. I mean, there is a language that our customers are speaking that's not being reflected in the product development or the marketing of many of the competitors in the space. And so you can tell that there is that element of that customer connection is kind of missing. And there's just a rush to make sure that you have the capabilities that your competitors are offering so that you can check the box. Um, I think another thing that companies need to do is try to really understand who are our customers, right? Why are our customers buying from us? You know, what? what is it so, what is it that we're bringing to the table? Let the customers tell us why they think that you know, we're great and then continue to develop and iterate and serve that customer base um, as well. And so therefore you still have that, that human connection when you're developing your products, your marketing messages, your outreach, et cetera. Yeah, all great points. Mm -hmm. I saw Sharon had a question about, um, do these midpoint surveys that I was referring to lead to a higher number of deals being closed? I don't have direct experience yet. We're literally just launching this, but from the research I've seen, it does for one main reason. Of course, it's not instantaneous, right? It's the ability to bring in that data and look at it over time so that yes, you get used to using that in the immediate term to turn around and change your tactics if you need to, or, or change your vocabulary to Monique's point, if, if you're not speaking the language of, of your potential customer correctly or whatever the problem is. But long-term, it does al also allow us to look at, okay, where do we need to shift our sales strategy overall mm -hmm. uh, you know, as an organization? Because let's be real, the types of organizations that are going to use this level of information are larger. They do have sales strategies in place for for fairly you know mid to large sales force. And so you have to be able to look at that at a macro level as well as in the near term being reactive to those clients because you can use it to plan moving forward and not just be reactive. I love one point, Victoria, I just want to circle back around on your customer feedback sessions, I think mm -hmm. on your product feedback sessions. I think this is a great place for CI professionals to tap in with their customer insights teams, their customer experience teams to say, what are your ongoing forums that you already have in place where you're talking directly to customers? So whether it's a product feedback session as you're iterating on a new product, whether it's a client advisory board, um, that when, when I was at Equifax and ran the client advisory board, that was an, a, an amazing kind of focus group where we could test competitor hypotheses. You know, yeah. so we're hearing this new product was just launched. What do you guys think about that? This, the forum is already in place. The customers are already gathered. Um, and so getting some time on that agenda potentially to pressure test your hypotheses about competitors or the marketplace is a great addition to the to the agenda that um, these teams already have with customers. And so, you know, just trying to figure out what's already going on and plugging in uh, to those ongoing forums, I think is a great idea. Another intersection place for CI and CX. Yeah, yeah, totally agree. And that's one thing that since where I am at Baker Tilly, we're really in a nascent place with CX. And so everything that we're doing is pretty much either pretty new or not new. And so as we're looking at building these, these interaction points with our clients, Monique, it's such a great point uh, to look at the intersections. A lot of folks do this retroactively where they're like, okay, what is being done? And we are trying to build it proactively so that we're intersecting with the right pieces of our organization at the right time as we're building this to make sure that we're not wasting any time 
right? Mm -hmm. And I, yeah. I think that that is key because a lot of folks are just now in the last few years really starting to look at, and this is true no matter the industry, no matter what type of your business you're in, it's really just in the last few years that I feel like folks are really realizing, oh, it doesn't matter what we do if we aren't listening to our to our clients and our customers. And not just, again, what we think they're saying, but really pressure testing that and making sure that we are hearing them correctly and that we are speaking their language, to your point, Monique. And so as you're building a CX program, you, it's you're going to go much further if you pay attention to where those intersections could be and build them in at the beginning. I can't stress that enough because again, operating in silos only gets you so far, particularly when you are talking about how does our client and our customer interact with us? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Uh, I'm just trying to look through the, oh, here's Liz. Yeah. I, okay, so we had a question from Sharon that I thought we could jump in with um, and it relates to this. Um, we're talking about the human connection, but what about with this rise of technology solutions? Are you finding that leadership, so you're with your professional services firm, technology developer, are you seeing, um, she asks, um, are they pushing tech first, which is could be at the expense of these human connections? Is that something that either of you are seeing in your organizations? I don't know that tech first is how I would describe it, but tech driven, I think, mm -hmm. is how I would describe it. Because at the end of the day, we have to use technology. We have to use some sort of AI to drive data analysis when we're generating the amount of data on our clients that we are at any given point in time. So you can't do that successfully at scale without technology, technology solutions. Um, but at the end of the day, we are talking about what our people internally and externally are saying and feeling about us. And so no matter what, even if if we are being driven by technology, the human interaction piece of this is always going to be at the forefront. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, from from our perspective, I, I can only speak from, you know, from a Qualtrics perspective. You know, our goal when, as we're looking at this space is we are, we are recognizing that there are a ton of touch points, right? You have social media reviews, you have people navigating your website, you have people calling into the contact center, you have people talking with their, with their CSMs, you have, it, there are so many different touch points where customers are leaving feedback on their experience. And one of the great ways, to Victoria's point, to be able to scale the collection, the analysis, and putting it all in a format so that we can actually take action on it uh -huh. is to leverage some of the newer technologies that are out there, um, including AI. So I don't think it is a, a move to kind of replace um, or interfere with the human connection, but it is a way to drive insight so that we can strengthen those connections. It was nearly impossible, if you think about a couple of years ago, trying to see, well, what are they saying about us on Twitter versus what, what's happening in our contact center because someone missed their flight, um, but then also what's happening you know, at, from a business account that we may have and culling all of that information together manually. Um, we just it, it was just out of the realm of being able to synthesize that level of data um, in a way that it can be actioned on. And that's the real important point, right? We don't just want to collect data for data's sake, but we want to be able to actually improve those experiences. And so these are tools that are empowering our internal teams to be able to collect, understand, and then action on that data. So I, I don't necessarily see it as a, as a replacement, um, but absolutely as a mechanism to enhance the work that the humans at the companies are already doing. Can I agree more, Monique? Oh, let's see. Oh, Liz, go ahead. So yeah, I think this would be, we have a couple more segments on our outline to, to tackle. So I think I'm gonna go off and let you guys kind of finish out. Is there another slide that you'd like up on the screen to close us, the choose your own adventure one? Sure, let's go okay. there. Sounds good. I think that, that this slide that's about to come up speaks to a lot of what we've already gone into in depth. You know, with when you're trying to figure out, okay, what is CX? What could it be for my company? What could it be for my career? It really is. What do you what do you want it to be? What do you want to focus on? Because there are so many 
intersections within here. Um, I haven't really touched on this yet, but the way that we interact with within CX at Baker Tilly with our intelligence team is we are partners. We are passing information back and forth, but we're also piggybacking off of one another quite a bit. So for instance, when we're looking at, should we build a product? We wait for the intelligence team to do market research and do a TAM before we decide if we're gonna go do client feedback sessions to pressure test that value proposition to see what sort of, of pricing and packaging models would make sense. Um, so there's a lot of going back and forth that can happen here. And as you're trying to figure out, okay, where do I wanna land within CX? Just remember, it doesn't have to just be in CX. You can do CX work anywhere within the realm of intelligence. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. I think that, um, you know, as we look at these various areas, you can have an entire role just <laughs> just looking at one of these. I look at sales enablement um, in particular. I mean, and I would say most of my role here at Qualtrics is around empowering our sales team to really understand what's happening in the competitive market um, so that we are positioning ourselves in the right way. Um, and that we are well informed of, of what competitors are doing and saying, um, either in response to us or just on their own. And so a lot of what I do really falls around that sales um, sales enablement um, tract, you know, as it's outlined here. But the, there could be an intelligence unit for any one of these buckets. And I think I've worked across, you know, worked across a lot of these buckets. I think what's really important, and, and Victoria, you and I talked about this too, is kind of where do we see CX and CI um, leading in organizations? Like what types of organizations do we see are really putting the muscle behind CX and CI? And it really depends on like the strategic um, direction and energy of the company that you're in. You know, we, I am in a, a tech company, uh, you know, it is really around, you know, empowering our sales, uh, empowering our sales teams, as well as providing some good product intelligence um, right. to our product teams. Um, but I also come from, um, you know, Equifax, where there was only three players in the market on our credit bureau side of the house. There's, we know who the competitors are. We know what they're saying. We know what they're doing. We see them every day. Um, and so therefore that, that lens was more strategic. You know, what does this industry, this, this data intelligence industry look like seven, 10 years from now? So we were doing things like war gaming and scenario planning, um, some really long range competitive strategy. And so that caused different interactions with our customer insights team than would kind of like a tech, um, our, our tech company. So it really depends on what type of company that you're in, what is their strategy, what is their appetite? Um, and then that will really determine the type of like competitive intel org you will have, whether it's really forward thinking or maybe even kind of shorter term um, looking as well. Yeah, totally agree, Monique. And I would add that um, the other thing to consider is what does the leadership of the company really consider important? Because I think that we're all very used to being the experts in whatever we're looking at, because I think anyone who's ever been anything close to an intelligence professional knows that we go in deep. We understand what we're looking at in a way that no one else will, because we want to understand all the various facets of it. But that doesn't mean that we're looking at something that our leadership cares about that's keeping them up at night. And so along with figuring out, OK, what really makes sense to focus on because of our company size or, or breadth of our products or, or other market factors that are influencing us, what, do, what does my leadership care about? Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. It, I think you're absolutely right that all of these little um, spurs could be um, a career move in its own. <clears throat> and as in a professional service firm, this is my second time in a professional service firm, first time in legal and now in accounting and advisory. And the challenge is similar for both in that the world is changing and so our business model is changing. Mm -hmm. And so whereas 15 years ago, it was just about providing a service to a client and saying, hooray, you liked what we did, you will come back and pay us some more. Now there's a need for more subscription-based services for uh, so that there's consistent pricing for our clients. There's more of a need for our clients to come and tell us, I just want X, Y, and Z, and they're very definitive in that. 
and they've done their research, they know what they need and they wanna come tell us. And so suddenly our experts play a different role for them. And so we're really hoping to shift that business model over time, as well as figure out within that business model, how can we close the deal? What should we be building? What should we be selling? And so it's it's a weird kind of split, right? We're both very strategic, but then we're also very tactical. And it's hard to go deep with both of those. Yes. And so, and so that's something to consider too, as you're walking through your career path, you don't have to do everything everything all at once for everyone in a company. It's okay to kind of pick and choose where you need to be based on what the needs of your business are at that point. And sometimes that is going to mean that you're doing a little bit more shallow effort, more spread out across the company. Sometimes that means you're going to be really laser focused on something like Monique, you at Equifax, really focused on the industry because you knew your competitors. Um, and so just something to think about as you're trying to figure out where can I really integrate the idea of CX into my work it doesn't have to be everything yeah. right at the start. Absolutely. I, I think also too, you know, if you are really in tune with the work as a CI professional, if you're really in tune with the work and the outputs of the CX organization, you can start to see the seeds that are being planted in a market, right? And you can start to hear that, hear and interpret that sentiment that perhaps the market is shifting, that perhaps new types of competitors are coming in, that perhaps customers are getting frustrated with the status quo solutions that are being offered and are real and have some emerging needs that they didn't have before because of many, because of things that are happening in their own industry, right? And so sitting in that CI seat and really interacting well with the CX organization, you can then also start to surface those insights to leadership to maybe even encourage that shift from tactical to strategic. Um, yeah. I think there is this, this lofty goal for a lot of CI professionals that like strategic is the goal. Like, oh, we want a seat at the CI, you know, at the CEO table and things like that. And, that, and that's all great. Um, it's however you're moving the needle within your company. If that's winning more deals, um, you know, closing more deals, getting that win percentage up, then, then that's a win uh, for the CI organization. But if it is kind of being that, that early warning system within your organization to say, hey, you know, we've really been focused on these five competitors that we've been having this dogfight with for a number of years, but customers are saying they're frustrated, want new things, exploring other competitors, looking at adjacent markets to fulfill their needs, you can start to move that shift perhaps from tactical to strategic within your organization um, or start to encourage that shift as well. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and Sharon actually left a comment in the chat here that that gets at your points a little bit here, Monique, that there are times when something isn't keeping leadership up at night that should be. And yes. This is where having the voice of the customer can really be compelling because nothing is going to get leadership to listen quite like our customers are saying they're out of here unless we can give them X, Y, and Z, regardless of whether that's a strategic conversation or a tactical conversation. I don't know of any CEO that wouldn't hear that and go, oh, okay, maybe we need to shift things. So it, a lot of times that voice of the customer can really be what you need to get leadership to start engaging with more proactive shifts, uh, listening to the headwinds a little bit more and figuring out, okay, what should we be doing next? What should we be doing instead? Yes. Even from a competitive perspective too, I I like, I wanted to just plus one in the chat, even though I'm on the webinar with you. Um, but yes, I completely agree. There are times when we would tell, you know, senior leadership, hey, you know, our pricing, we, maybe we want to look at the way we price things, or maybe we want to look at the way we're going to market with something, or maybe we want to look at the way, whatever it is. When we have that customer data, the verbatims from customers, whether it's from the buyer experience program, the CX, um, our customer satisfaction, or our churn <laughs> sentiment, when we have that outlined as real key data points to say, hey, this is coming directly from our customers. Mm -hmm. So now do you believe us that we need to do this in order to be more competitive? It is one of the most compelling pieces of data that we can present. So absolutely, totally agree with you on that. 
Yeah, and you're so right, especially when we talk about churn. And a lot of people are like, well, we lost customers and they didn't give us feedback, so we don't know what to fix. But the thing is that what people don't say is often just as important as what they do say. And this is why looking at your client and customer information on a macro level is so important. Because I can tell you that once we have a really large stable of data from our win-loss analysis, I want to look back in a year and say, okay, who just ghosted out of a deal? And what sort of services were they in for? What teams were they interacting with? What sort of strategies were we using with them and that they just left us? Right. And then a similar, we do an NPS. And so when when I look at folks that rate us a one or, or a two and they don't leave any sort of qualitative feedback, that tells me something. Mm -hmm. They have They don't want to interact with us at all. Right. And so then I start looking at the trends on a higher level again, like who are these clients? Is there a specific part of the business that we really need to pay attention to, to dive in deeper? And so it's really important to listen to not only what our, what our clients and customers are saying, but what they're not. And again, going back to the technology piece, that's something that you won't get from AI necessarily. That's something that, that you need people sitting there doing the work to identify those spaces for improvement. Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. I think we have maybe a couple minutes left. Liz, did we want to take just one or two questions or how did he? Oh, you're on mute. I'm okay. on mute. <laughs> okay. I think we, I'm just looking back through the chat. Um, there was, uh, Sharon had mentioned social media as a approach with collecting insights from customers. You did briefly touch on Twitter. So I don't know if there's anything you wanted to expand okay, on that. I've never seen all these days. <laughs> um, yes, um, I, I know that our company absolutely does incorporate social media uh, feedback into the overall analysis of customer experience and, and our tool um, does that for companies as well. And even from a competitive perspective, um, I also use some tools online that kind of look across social media um, and then um, we'll call that information together from a competitive perspective. So absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Same. Um, I use a tool called OneUp. I know that someone asked me what tools I was using. Um, I use a tool called OneUp um, and that has competitive, um, basically like crawling functions to be able to analyze what's happening from a social media perspective. Yeah, I've done that in the past as well. I'm not responsible for doing any, any of it now. I think it's also important to, uh, to not only look on social media for what your customers are saying, but for what your employees are saying. You know, I always say that my everyone employed by my company is my internal client. And what our internal folks are saying really speaks to how they're going to interact with our potential clients clients and customers and our current clients and customers. And so it's important to be monitoring for that as well, because that will give you an idea, again, of the headwinds that are coming. If, you're, if your workforce doesn't believe in what you're doing, if they have problems with what you're building, then you want to hear about that and listen to that, because that's going to impact whether or not they're able to actually sell to your customers. Absolutely. Yes. Um, well, I think that, yeah, that takes us to the top of the hour. So thank you so much, ladies, for the, I feel like this has been such a valuable and worthwhile time. Thank you for all of the um, great insights. Derek Johnson, uh, one of the leaders at the CI Fellows, who's been uh, curating this year's uh, summit, has offered to give two registrations away to some of the attendees. So we will get together and figure out who that um, is after this. So thank you, Derek. And we've had such amazing interaction. There was so many fellows in the chat today um, besides yourself. So um, thank you, Phil and Craig and Parmalee and um, Andrew said awesome session to you both. So thank you all for coming today. Know that the recording link will be sent in the email and that'll come in two days, I want to say. So not right away, but look for that in your email. And um, the, yes, as Austin just shared the, um, there's going to be a registration. It, it's open for the next talk, which is November 7th with Dr. Ken Saka. So um, we'll also send more information out around that. Thanks, Eric. Thanks, Judith. Um, but yeah, we are, I think with that, we'll, we're set to close out. Ladies, thank you so much for your time and taking it out of your busy days to share. Thank you everyone for being here. Yeah.